uh, the next uh, sessions about data anonymization and curation across clinical center. And we have for this the derived moderator, uh, Karin Seymour, expert in this field from France. And I, uh, of course, uh, welcome Karin to moderate the sessions. Please, Karin. Thank you very much, Emanuele, and thank you. It's an honor for me to be moderating this session, so thank you very much for, for inviting me. Uh, so, so my name is Karine Seymour. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Medexprim. Uh, we are a French company, and uh, we are part of the two of the projects uh, which are within this AI for HI initiative, uh, the Primage project about uh, pediatric uh, oncology and Chameleon project. Uh, and I'm the, the technical leader of the Chameleon project, and more specifically, um, uh, Medexprim is in charge of all the, the put of, of setting up methodologies and tools uh, for the data preparation process, so extraction, the identification, uh, curation within the hospital uh, before this data uh, arrives to the central repository. So in, in this session, we will first have a, a talk uh, given by uh, Lawrence uh, Tarbox, and I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Lawrence who is from the uh, University of Arkansas, and uh, he is also the chair of the DICOM Standard Committee, uh, the architect of the Cancer Imaging Archives, uh, and uh, he is in charge of the, the work group uh, within uh, you Can Image um, for the, everything that has to do with uh, uh, data creation, data harmonization, and so on. So um, I, I will let uh, Laurent introduce himself and do uh, his presentation, and then we will welcome uh, for the panels, for the, the following panel, um, two other uh, panelists, uh, Nicolas and Harry Dimos, which I will then introduce. Well, good afternoon, or for me, it's good morning, but uh, I'm uh, sitting here at the Supercomputing 21 conference. So uh, hopefully you can see my slides and you can hear me correct. Uh, okay. I'm yeah, seeing. Uh, yeah. Okay. And uh, all right. So I, the, 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 we're going to be talking about any you can image, it's called Work Package 4. It's a, it's a number of different things. Uh, but we're focusing here in this talk about data anonymization and curation. And this is near and dear to my heart because. Uh, uh, way back in uh, 1999, I, uh, uh, we established the security committee in DICOM. And one of the things we uh, tackled during this security committee is how would you take a DICOM object and make it so that it's shareable, that it no longer has any uh, personally identifiable health information in it. You know, at that point in time, there was the, uh, um, the HIPAA laws that, that were mentioned earlier. Uh, there were also various data privacy laws in Japan and in, and in the U.S. And so we came up with a set of a, a profile that, and that profile has been kept up to date over the years as here are the data elements inside of DICOM that you need to worry about and how you need to worry about them in order to, one, not break DICOM, but uh, two, make the, make the image so that it would be extremely difficult to go back and identify who the patient originally was. I'm trying to get my, there we go. Um, part of the reason for this, uh, this is a, an opinion piece that appeared in the journal Nature. Um, and uh, it's that we wanted to foster what we research repro reproducibility. And that was also one of the tenets behind the establishment of the Cancer Imaging Archive was to foster reproducible research, the ability for a researcher to take someone's data and their journal article and figure out how to reproduce the results, to, to essentially duplicate their results and then potentially extend it further. Um, and uh, uh, Francis Collins, who uh, heads the, the National Institute of Health here in the US, made the following statement in this opinion piece, documenting of this kind require of reproducibilities, thus requires at minimum the sharing of analytical data sets, the original data, the process data, the relevant metadata, the analytical code, and the related software. Um, and so that's kind of at the heart of, I, I think, in a way, part of what why EU can image was established as well, was to to try to uh, 
foster this sharing of data so that we could uh, get to reproducible research, research and also to, to make it so that, that uh, um, well, as uh, Karim had pointed out, uh, usually one single institution does not have enough data to train something as complicated as an AI model. You, you need a wide variety of data. And as was discussed in the last hour, from a wide variety of different kinds of subjects, from a wide geographic area, from all over the world, if you're really going to have AI models that, that work. Um, but curating this data uh, to make it so that you can have reproducible resource research is very time consuming. It is not as easy as it looks. A lot of people over the years have said, well, you know, I just apply the, that anonymization profile in DICOM part 315 and I'm done. Uh, and I can tell you that if we had solely done that in, in uh, the cancer imaging archive, we would have, uh, we would have, would have had a lot of data breaches. And why? Well, because personal information appears in the strangest of places. You know, a description of a piece of machinery, which shouldn't have any personal identifiable information in it, will have the name of the technician or sometimes the name of the doctor. And a procedure description might even have the name of a, a patient. The procedure description is supposed to be generic. Um, and those things are not necessarily covered by a mechanical, well, let's just follow this recipe to get rid of the data. It takes more time to do that. In addition, so what we really want is you want an information source that is well curated, where everything is well organized. You know how all the parts fit together. You know what the end goal is. A well curated information source is what we're looking for. And that requires that not just that the data be anonymized, but the acquisition protocols have to be consistent. Otherwise you'll get different answers from different scanners. You need to have a consistent coverage of the anatomy being imaged. Uh, the metadata that's being gathered, uh, the clinical associated clinical data, has to be gathered in such a way that they're comparable. Um, you have to be using the correct DICOM formats and be using them correctly. There needs to be some aspect of quality control uh, to say that, yes, this data meets our minimum quality criteria. And all of this folds into what we call data curation. So it's, it's not a simple thing. But if you don't do it, what you end up with is a data dump. A lot of the repositories we've seen um, are just dumps of data. They're not very organized. I challenge you if you needed to find a part for your car to find it in that data dump there. It's gonna be hard to find it because it's not very well organized. There's very little quality control. You, we need more than a data dump in order to do reproducible research. So that's where Work Package 4 was, was started. Um, the idea primarily was to, to create this suite of tools that met the legal requirements that we were talking about uh, last hour, um, that uh, can incorporate existing tools, including the positive tools that we use in, in the Cancer Imaging Archive to expand them, to deal with more kinds of data and data that's not necessarily images. Um, you heard about the synthetic image generation. Um, that can go for test sets as well as for training sets. Uh, for example, we're currently working uh, with a, because people like to claim that their anonymization tools are perfect, uh, we create what I call it the uh, anonymization torture set. We went over 10 years of history in the Cancer Imaging Archive to come up with all the little tricks that we've found over the years where people hide uh, personal data and created a torture set. And of course, since we didn't want this torture set to be violating any GDPR rules, all the images in the torture set that, we, that will be released are synthetic. So they don't actually belong to a person, but they look real. Um, the, and then implementing the tools to, to standardize that. And because data curation is hard, part of what we're also looking at is, are there AI methodologies that we could use to try to uh, simplify it. Right now, data curation is a very heavily manual process. And if we could, the more we can assist the curator in doing their job and doing it well, the better. So um, we're just in the first year. Uh, a lot of what we've been doing is on the, uh, the, the, the first task. Well, 
many of the tasks toward the end of this list uh, are things for later years, but there's been a lot of work that's been done on the synthetic image generating and the, uh, the, the, the first four the first four tasks. Um, uh, one of the things is we've looked at all the anonymization tools that are out there uh, and have come up with a framework which we think will work. Um, and we've been working in conjunction with the uh, data privacy working group, uh, um, the, you know, Davida and, and his team, to, to try to create a framework. And a, a, a manuscript is in pre preparation, hopefully will be published soon. Um, we wanted to create this GDR compliant legal framework where the sites uh, without violating GDPR can share their data. And it looks kind of like this. I, this is uh, eye candy, you might not be able to read it all. Uh, and this is also very much still in a state of flux. It's under dis under, still under discussion. Uh, but the idea is that the local institution, whom we call the data controller, they control the access, you know, what data gets out. So nothing leaves the institution that has any identifiers in it. Uh, when the institution decides it's time to share a, a bolus of data, uh, at the institution, we'll, we will provide them with tools to be able to de-identify de that and then securely transmit that into the central repository. So the central repository is the data processor. Uh, and of course, there has to be proper agreements between the data controller and the data processor in order to get that data. Uh, the data processor will complete the, the next steps in the curation process. Uh, this may include uh, going to uh, uh, the annotation, which you'll hear about in, in the coming hour, uh, that, that where the annotated data comes back to the repository. And again, we curate it again to make sure it's consistent with the other data. Uh, it's also possible to then send that data to the AI developer with all the labels. Uh, and all of these will be covered by agreements between the data processor and the subprocessors to, to treat this now I de-identify data or, or the, the correct term, if I recall correctly in, in GDPR is pseudonymized data uh, into the, uh, to the, to the local, to, to the AI developer. Okay, so this ne these next few slides we're gonna go over very quickly. Um, uh, the idea is that you, um, that the sending site will get a set of tools, they'll launch those tools uh, the tools look somewhat like this. Yeah, you select what data you're going to send and you fire off this wizard. You, you collect what data you're gonna send, you fire off this wizard where you can import that data into the tool. You can confirm that you've got the right data that you're going to be sharing. So you don't accidentally share something you're not. You configure a, a, what we call a, an ID mapping table where you, you have your local patient ID and you create, okay, well, this is the ID that I'm going to send into the repository. So it's your job, the sending side's job to make sure that patient identifiers don't get sent into the repository. Um, and you keep this in case um, there is a, a, a problem. You can, you, you as the sending site will be able to pull it back. Um, then, when you say go, the system anonymizes the data. You can then inspect it to make sure you're satisfied with that anonymization and then send it to the central server. Um, and then, then the central server is where we'll do these consistency checks, verify that they're valid DICOM objects. We visually review them to make sure there's no burned in PHI. We check all the linkages to make sure all the pointers from data object to data object are pointing to each other correctly. Uh, if necessary, if some of the data is not consistent, we can edit it, and then ultimately it gets transferred into the central XNAT server. Um, there's also an alternate way of sending data that we're exploring, where instead of using that submission wizard that you saw previously, uh, many sites already have the CMRAD tools, which are being used to do the annotations on site. Um, we're looking at a workflow where they just stay in CMRAD to do the, uh, the collection of data for a submission, anonymization, and their initial annotation before shipping them off to the central archive for the final curation. So thank you. And um, I turn the time back over to Karina. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Um, I, please 
give your send your questions and we'll we'll respond we'll answer those questions uh, after uh, we introduce the the two coming panelists. So I would like to uh, first introduce Nicolas Papa Nicolaos. Sorry if my pronunciation is not very good. Uh, so Nicolas is Greek, but he lives in Lisbon and is a researcher. He's an expert in in AI, in imaging, and in radiomics. Um, and then we, we also have Aridimos. Uh, I don't know. I don't see you, Aridimos. I don't know if you are around. Yes, he's there. Aridimos Kondilakis, uh, who is uh, a researcher in Krita, and uh, he's an expert in uh, data harmonization and data models. And both are part of the Pro Cancer Eye project. Uh, and so maybe my first question will be to you, um, Nicolas. As you are an expert in AI and you use data daily and uh, you, you need to have this data uh, as uh, it, that's your raw material to be able to work, uh, what can you tell us about the challenges you see in terms of uh, data harmonization and data curation and uh, what is your, to you, how, how important it is and how crucial it is to have uh, fully curated uh, and harmonized data? First of all, many thanks for, for having me today. Um, yes, I'm, I'm coming here as, as the end user, as the client uh, or customer, I should say, trying to purchase your services, uh, the technical people services. And one very important um, struggle that we have been suffering so far, and probably that explains also the limited translation of what we call radiomics from research to the clinical uh, environment is the fact that contrary to non-imaging data, images are very heterogeneous by definition, meaning that they have been designed mostly to produce, you know, to please the eye, the human visual system, namely of radiologists, rather than to provide any kind of reproducible quantitative uh, capabilities. We have seen that for many years uh, working with uh, developing imaging biomarkers where each and everyone was having his own uh, calibration and uh, uh, reference values and everything but nothing was really reproducible in, in the neighboring hospital. So this is exactly the same story with radiomics. Uh, we have seen that our models worked works quite well as soon as we test them with data that are coming from the same institution or even the same protocol than the data that our models have been exposed to during the training phase. But then they fail uh, dramatically when we are testing them with external data uh, that are slightly different or very different. So there is a huge need of uh, harmonization um, that is very challenging technically when it comes to radiomic features per se. So uh, I would definitely love to see in the near future uh, a common standard uh, how to you know, define um, the uh, content of each radiomic feature because apparently what is happening today is that we are referring to the same features by name, but the values are very, very different. Thank you, Nicolas. So uh, while we were preparing this discussion yesterday, uh, Nicolas, you, you mentioned that your dream would be that all this would actually be included in the DICOM standard. And maybe the DICOM standard should take ownership on, on these problems and provide, and maybe there should be a working group on dedicated on radio mix features and making sure we all talk about the same acquisition protocols and the same processing on the data. So uh, Lawrence, maybe could you comment on that? So that, that's a, um, an interesting observation that many people have come to this uh, similar conclusions. Uh, at, you know, it, here, here in Little Rock, we, we came to a similar conclusion. And in the PRISM project, we've been, you know, we have the blessing, we have the full TCI and all the data that was submitted. And so, uh, and we also have um, a very good ontology team and Matthias Brockhausen and uh, Jonathan Bona. Uh, so we've been going through in conjunction with the University of Florida, looking at uh, 
what it, what are the common subsets? They've come up with a, on, on the order of, uh, you know, over the years, the data we've collected, over 800 different kinds of data elements that are in there. Uh, some of them did come from Diagon, but most of that data is from the ancillary reports that go along with, with, with uh, DICOM. And most of those reports are not in DICOM format. They're in other kinds of formats. Um, there, are, there is some measurement data that comes in DICOM, but not an awful lot. Uh, most of the aggregate reports are in, for example, uh, just uh, common separated value files, tables, if you will. Uh, which are not part of DICOM. They don't actually fit into the DICOM model readily. So that, that is a, a concern, and the question is how to represent them in an unambiguous fashion. My, uh, you know, I, I have a passion for data standardization, and there's a lot of work that's gone on to try to create consistent ontologies and vocabularies uh, and standards such as HL7 and DICOM and others uh, have, have tried to incorporate them, but the, you know, there's a old saying that says you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. Uh, we can provide all the tools and, and make it readily available for people, but if people don't use the tools, it, it kind of goes by the wayside. Um, there's uh, one portion of DICOM is a whole set. There's probably several hundred reporting templates. And um, there are only very niche groups that are using those reporting templates. Uh, it's expandable to more. Uh, on the flip side, in the HL7 world, if you look at FHIR, that is starting to grow with a series of, of templates. But again, it's, it's up to users to say, I want to use that. It's, much easier for the radiologist to sit there and dictate a re report and, and, and not, you know, that information then becomes extremely hard to capture in a, in a usable form for AI. But Lawrence, be beyond reports, and, and probably Harris will have interesting things to say about data models, because I don't know that it's uh, uh, the DICOM up to the DICOM standards to standardize all the clinical variables that we may have along with the images. And uh, we, I, I'm sure we will be talking about the OMOP data model, which is becoming like an uh, international mm -hmm. standard, but uh, more about the images themselves. Uh, I think what also Nicolas was referring to is the differences in the images themselves beyond um, just the beyond the metadata. Uh, or the, but um, you were saying in your presentation that one of the uh, important harmonization aspects are acquisition protocols, uh, for instance. Uh, how can we ensure that uh, all modalities and all vendors use the same acquisition protocols or um, and, and I guess that's one of the challenges that we are addressing within the, many of our projects, including the Chameleon project, is how can we harmonize the actual images um, to ensure that we are all talking about the same things and about, about the same radiomics features on images that come from different modalities. Yeah, so that's... Um, uh, the, for DICOM, that, that is mildly out of scope for DICOM. DICOM provides the methodologies for interchanging the images. It doesn't dictate how you got them, okay? However, there are other groups out there, uh, professional societies. Uh, uh, here in the US, there's the ACR and the RSNA, both who have been trying to uh, create uh, standardized procedure templates mm -hmm. that say, here's, if you're going to do this particular kind of exam, how do you, how, how are you supposed to set up the machine to do that exam? Um, <clears throat> for some of our research projects, <clears throat> uh, there's one that we were doing in the not too distant past, which involved MRI scanners to make sure the data was consistent. We actually uh, shipped a particular phantom to each of the sites so that it could calibrate their scanners so that we could uh, get that calibration correctly. Um, in AAPM, uh, and they work closely with their European uh, counterpart, that's the American Association of Medical Physicists, which I, the American part doesn't really seem to fit anymore because there's people from all over the world in there. And there's a European Association of Medical Physicists have also been 
trying to create the standardized ways of calibrating the, the scanners. So those are the groups to look for to try to get the images consistent. But I really agree with Nic Nicholas's uh, view that um, the way I capture an image in order to make it easy for a human being to read the image is not necessarily the way I would capture an image if I was feeding it to an AI algorithm, but which in my think, mind. Do you think it would be possible to have like new DICOM tags or things like that, that would actually give characteristics about the image? I'm thinking about pixel distribution or signal noise ratio or, or things like that, that, and these parameters could actually be used uh, by the, the, the AI vendors or, or the, the people uh, working on radio mix signature. And these parameters could actually be used to have reproducible um, radio mix features. That some of those tags do exist, but it certainly is in the purview to add the additional tags. Um, a lot of the, in a lot of the cases, those those kinds of tags are optional, and that goes back right back to uh, people when they when they set up their equipment, they must insist to the vendor, please include data in these tags, because yeah. okay. the vendor the vendors won't do it unless you ask them to. Okay, great, thank you. If, if I may continue on that, probably um, I, I, I didn't express myself in the proper way since what I was implying was to push the vendors to think and to comply with what quantitative imaging is required. Mm -hmm. uh, I can definitely be pragmatic by recognizing that the vendors are designing their scanners to produce eye-pleasing pictures. And this is exactly our problem. We are in a transitional era where we have to work with this kind of, of data, of images, that by definition should be heterogeneous and vary across the different vendors simply because each vendor is trying to exploit in the best way the different components of their technology to produce something that can satisfy the visual system, I repeat. So probably it's the time to consider a second stream of data that could come out from the scanners to be used exclusively for quantitative purposes, including radiomics, because it's not about definitions. We have the definitions, especially in radiomics, each and every feature is well-defined through a mathematical transformation and equation that needs to be applied on a pixel by pixel basis, right? It's not that, it's the fact that the signals, especially in the MRI scanners are not absolute, right? They are uh, influenced by the body habitus, by the technology of the reception coil, by the field strength, by so many different factors rather than biology itself. And this is exactly the main uh, problem. An alternative idea would be to go one layer deeper instead of reconstructing images that are meant to be generated for human visual inspection, someone could exploit raw data in order you know, to remove these potential alterations that uh, introduces all these problems. But again, that is a bit more technically challenging since vendors are not so open providing access to raw data. So I think now it's the time like many, many years ago, uh, I'm pretty sure Lawrence remembers that era where each and every vendor was producing his own DICOM uh, version, right? But the scientific and the clinical community demanded to have a common standard, that's DICOM. So we need to have common standards like DICOM, not within DICOM, that would satisfy any kind of quantitative imaging initiative in my opinion yeah and i and i couldn't agree more and there are people who have been trying to do that it's there's <clears throat> it's it's like atlas and his lever trying to move the world it's still a really big object to move but it, it doesn't it it doesn't get moved unless people keep hollering about it we we have to continually push the vendors and to 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 allow for this, the uh, there is a concern, at least with certain modalities, about about dose, not so much in in MR, but uh, you you do have to be careful not to overdose the patient. But sometimes, 
Um, you know, my opinion is we already overdose the patient. We give, in some cases, more dose than is needed to accomplish the task to create that pretty picture that, that you're referring to. And uh, so that those, those things have to be carefully watched. But I, I do believe that uh, it, it's going to take a body of researchers like yourself to let them let people know, well, if you were to change your acquisition protocol in this way, it, it makes that data more amenable to analysis while not impacting the diagnostic quality. Great. I, I suggest we move, move on to a, a, another topic and I'd like to, uh, I, I'd like for Harry Demos to be able to speak. Uh, and so Harry, uh, Harris, you, you've heard Lauren's presentation. Can you tell us how the strategy that was described in the You Can Image project uh, is similar or different to the one that uh, is in ProCancer Eye? We, are you using similar approaches or what are the differences? I would say the target is pretty much uh, the same, so the means are the same as well. Uh, so what, uh, how we treat the data in ProCancer Eye is that uh, still we go to the hospitals and we provide the tools for them to anonymize locally uh, their DICOM images. So everything is locally anonymized. And actually we employ a white listing uh, anonymization, let's say procedure. So the clinicians go select uh, the DICOM images and then uh, they enter uh, the corresponding metadata. So they complete some uh, ECRFs. And when they are ready and they have performed uh, all, uh, let's say, local validations by the tool that we give to them, uh, they say uh, upload uh, the image and the corresponding clinical metadata uh, to a staging area. And there at the staging area, uh, further validation is performed to ensure that everything is okay, that uh, uh, no, let's say, personal information is leaked, uh, etc. So at uh, the staging area, which is at the cloud, uh, we can have uh, further, uh, let's say, curation actions like uh, co-registration, annotation, uh, etc. And if everything is okay, and then uh, the data are released for uh, AI modelers. Let me also tell you that similarly, we have a, let's say, metadata catalog, which is Molgenis uh, in our case that indexes all actions, all uh, relevant metadata, and has links uh, to the data so that we can effectively search, uh, filter uh, whatever data we would like uh, to search. And also, let me also tell you that we try to homogenize uh, both the clinical metadata uh, that we have uh, using uh, OMOPCDM. And, all, uh, and actually some extensions uh, that have to do uh, with oncology. Uh, certainly we would like, uh, we are currently exploring how to extend the MOP to, uh, to store additional, let's say, radiomic uh, uh, metadata, which, is, uh, mi which are missing uh, from the MOP CDM. So we are also part of uh, OH DSI working group on, uh, let's say, radiomics, uh, but we just uh, started uh, that working group and we are learning uh, what should be stored and how in the OMOPCDM. Great, thank you. If, if I may add something to Harris, uh, Karin, mm -hmm. I think one important differentiation between ProCancer Eye and UK Nimitz is the fact that we uh, opted for a complete anonymization approach. And yeah. therefore we are not subjected to any restrictions from GDPR. And we took that decision because the ProCancer Eye repository is designed for a continuous, let's say, accessibility to the data, even after the completion of the project, which would complicate significantly in the event of pseudo-anonymized or de-identified data, because there might be, you know, occasions where patients might exercise the right to revoke their data, and that would be extremely uh, technically almost impossible, especially if this data has been used 
to train models, right? It would like be disassemble models and retain again with fewer data, which is a, a mess. So we went directly for complete anonymization that of course, um, uh, logistically is, is, is very, very challenging because the, the clinicians that needs to gather and curate the data locally have only one opportunity to upload the data and they, they should do it only at once, simply because they don't know uh, uh, which patient is which on the final repository, which is a bit a uh, burden to, uh, to go for complete anonymization. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, and thank you for raising that. And uh, and uh, I'd like to ask a question, and please, the, the panelists from the previous sessions, especially the, the lawyers, it would be interesting for you to jump in if you if you'd like. Uh, I, I really like the definition in the previous uh, session where you explain that uh, the definition of anonymization in GDPR was quite a bit different than the one in HIPAA. And, and in fact, um, I don't know that uh, pseudonymize that there is a difference in HIPAA uh, of pseudonymization versus anonymization. So I, it'd be interesting to, to know about the, the lawyers, uh, whether there is a difference. But in fact, you're right. In GDPR, there is a big difference. And, and in, I know that uh, in the Chameleon project, it's also has been a big debate on whether we should do pseudonymization or anonymization. And like in the pro cancer eye project, we opted for anonymization. But that has some consequences. Uh, like you said, that means that um, the, 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 the patients cannot uh, exercise their rights uh, to be forgiven. Uh, for the project, so that's uh, one consequence, and that also means that you can only submit um, fully curated and complete uh, patient data set. Uh, so uh, we, you can only work on retrospective data, and for our case, that means that we need to have all the follow-ups, follow-up exams of a patient uh, before you submit that to the to the central repository. You cannot add additional time points later on. Uh, so but, this as a consequence means that all of the, the data preparation and curation process has to be done up front uh, within the hospital. Uh, and so that makes it a bit more complicated and that also makes it slower to actually get data to the data repository because that all this preparation cannot be done on the platform. Um, yeah, the, so, yeah, go ahead, Lawrence. Yeah, there's also the question of training. Um, like I said, this uh, curation is not easy. And it would be very difficult to um, train individuals at 20, 30 institutions <clears throat> how to do the curation properly. Um, in TCIA, for example, we have four curation teams, each of them trained for two, probably on the order of two to three months before we fully trusted them to be able to do the, the, uh, the data. Um, now, now, that doesn't mean they were unproductive for that period of time. It's just that there were people looking over their shoulders yeah. for that. So uh, hopefully we can make that simpler, but that's one of the one of the headaches that we that that we have is how, how do you uh, um, and, and there, there's also a question. I mean, we do everything we can to try to make sure there is absolutely nothing in the image that potentially could identify the patient. But the one of the questions that was raised uh, during our discussions was, well, the image itself. If you just happen to have access to the repository, the, the clinical repository where the image came from, you could theory, theoretically do an image comparison against all the images in the repository mm -hmm. and figure out who that anonymized. Uh, right. So the question is, well, can you ever really fully de-identify de to the point where it no longer falls under GDPR? And that's a question I have to leave to the lawyers. I know this is Magdalena has her hand. Yes, <laughs> Magdalena, please, <laughs> you go ahead. <laughs> uh, yes, hi, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to actually, uh, the, 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 you know, uh, contribute to this question because that is something that we've been uh, also in our incisive project uh, discussing back and forth. And actually that was the first topic that we discussed in the, LZ uh, group uh, for, of, of the cluster, um, the anonymization versus pseudonymization. And we are actually, um, we, we are thinking about uh, drafting a paper that our working title would be the trap of anonymization. And I think what is very interesting is the misconception or the 
the the popular understanding of the term anonymization versus what is the definition of the GDPR. And um, I, I think a, a lot of researchers, uh, even those that are very familiar with medical data, they, uh, when, when we talk about anonymization, they focus on um, um, deleting or obscuring um, different identifiers and, and the metadata that are attached to the image. So the, the, the first and last name of the patient, the patient ID number, um, case number, you know, the, the time and date of, of um, examination, because that can also um, be a link to, to uh, who, who the patient was. But we forget that um, the GD, so, so that is the popular understanding of the anonymization that it, as long as we remove those identifiers, we are fine. We, we have de-identified the, the image and the data properly. While under GDPR, uh, the the definition is it goes further because it really says that um, we are uh, considering whether anyone uh, using reasonable means could um, re-identify the patient. So this would potentially include the hospital or the the, the center that contributed the image in the first place, and given the computational resources that are available right now. Um, there is, you know, possibility that uh, if you have an image, even without any identifiers, without saying who's, uh, which, who was the patient and the, the original image with the patient data on it, you could link those together if you are working in that uh, hospital. So that is the, the problem that GDPR really puts the bar on anonymization very, very, very high. And um, the trap that we are talking about is that if you haste into saying that the data is anonymous so that the GDPR does not apply, then you might wind up in a situation where this data is actually personal data, um, but you have not implemented all the necessary safeguards. So, I mean, that's also, I think that's also the reason why we have been talking about uh, synthetic data, because if we have synthetically generated the data, at that point, uh, it's not tied to any living thing. Yes, yes, that's that's one of the sort of solutions that is proposed out there, I must agree. But then the question is, how do you generate this synthetic data? Don't you need some output data to feed into the algorithms right. that create the synthetic data. So you do you still have the problem of, of using um, the the original data, of course, in a in a more, much more closed environment, but still the the problem does not magically disappear. It's just um, a, a different one. I think the the devil lies uh, within the wording reasonable means. Exactly, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Because exactly, because as Lauren's comments, obviously, if you have access to all the images from your packs and you can compare, maybe you could identify the patient. But if you, if your images are on a central repository and you don't know from which institution it comes from, uh, then I don't. I mean, that's that's like the position we we took within the Chameleon project is that we did all the processing and done on on the images and on the clinical data so that you, there is no reasonable mean to re-identify re the patients uh, indeed so that's the approach and, and but it is a very subjective word right what does this mean reasonable mean <laughs> exactly but i i have a rather naive question <laughs> to to magdalena if if you allow me if you are already um a member of, of the clinical institution, you already have access to the whole data. So why do you really need to, to do that? Which is a very time consuming process, right? Uh, you mean that, uh, why would you uh, want to re-identify re the data? Well, it's not about the materialization of this risk. It is um, more of a, Theoret uh, theoretical discussion, when can we say that the data is anonymous in the meaning of, of, of the GDPR? Of course, I, I mean, 
as a you know a, a logical argument i completely agree that it doesn't make sense that we should be looking at the perspective of a potential malicious actor that is outside of the um, facility or uh, you know just the user of the repository not the the doctor that is um, uh, has already access to the data and uh, is uh, bound by medical secrecy laws. That's not the person that is going to cause the data leak. But um, uh, because GDPR is phrased in this way, and we have not, well, the, 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 of course, the, the interpretation, the, the, that's what the lawyers do, we interpret the law. Um, we, there has not been a more um, elastic or flexible uh, interpretation of this term uh, when um, when uh, I, when were, when such statements were issued by the data protection authorities or the European Data um, uh, Protection Board, they have been quite cautious and um, it, they were more focused on, on on the privacy of patients. And this. Um, I'm not saying this is, you know, uh, something that I completely agree with. I, I don't. I see that this is a problematic approach, uh, but but that's that's the reality we are facing. That um, the data providers and we must understand their perspective uh, are may be afraid of um, sharing their data because this data would be still um, treated as um, personal data and then they must, uh, for example, inform the patients or obtain their consent or or find another legal basis for sharing. So um, uh, sorry for taking so much time in this panel, <laughs> um, but but I think this is a very, very interesting point and quite common to, to, to this, um, uh, to, to all of our uh, projects. Probably now it's the time to revise GDPR and make it more feasible <laughs> and more friendly for further development of AI because we are suffering in Europe, contrary to our, to our counterparts. I hope you, you do agree because leaving it in a very obscure way and just uh, uh, transferring the, the obligations to someone else doesn't really facilitate the whole sector of AI. And it's a bit controversial to spend so much money to projects like the ones that we are involved on one side and then push us back on the other side without giving us access to the data. Yeah, my hopes lie not so much in the modification of the GDPR as such. This would be a very time consuming and lengthy process, <laughs> uh, but perhaps um, convincing and, give, and, and, and getting into dialogue with the data protection authorities uh, th that have the enforcement, enforcement power. That's, that's one sort of um, light in the end of this tunnel. Uh, but uh, more importantly, uh, the, um, the, the, the foreseen AI Act, which provides some legal basis for processing of um, health data uh, to avoid biases, and that was touched upon in, in the first panel, that um, the, the data cannot it must be of good quality, it cannot be biased. Um, and then the third uh, issue is the creation of the European health data space and designing an ecosystem and a framework where this data can be shared also in a pseudonymized way, but in a way that is secure and that allows the patients to be aware what is going on and um, to, to have a control of their data. So just, that, that's, just a, yeah. just a sorry, small point on the yeah, GDPR. I'm sorry, I, I need to interrupt you. I'm sorry, because okay, we, sorry. we, are, no we are coming at the end of the session and, and we do have a question from the audience. And so I, it's not necessarily completely related to the topics, but Topic, but maybe we can still attempt to to respond is from Rachel and so she says I wonder who decides who and for what purpose someone can access to the open access biobanks to ensure ethical compliance is there an external committee um, so maybe Lawrence because the TCIA is in open access and it, I guess it could be considered as an open access biobank and it's probably the, the most mature of all the projects that are represented here. Maybe you could try and respond to this question. Well, that, that is a, <clears throat> it's an extremely loaded question. <laughs> um, so in, in TCI, we have two categories of collections. One, one is where they are completely open and one there's no need to ask permission to download it. Uh, anyone 
on the planet can download it. In fact, people, I think the last time I looked, the only place was some country in the middle of Africa and Antarctica were the only two continents that hadn't downloaded some data from TCIA. Um, we don't decide that. We leave it up to the, 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 the individual institution and their laws. The, the individual institution is responsible for making sure that human subject data is done is used in an ethical manner. Um, there are international accords that, that uh, most countries, but not all, have signed on to. Um, and so, so basically, we leave it to the institution. In the case of the um, restricted access collections, the, the principal investigator, the team that submitted the data, they're the ones that decide whether or not um, the suggested use of the, the requested use of the data uh, complies with with uh, their uh, ethical restrictions. So it, th there is a little bit of a check there, but it's it there is not a in, at least not in TCI. There's not a central committee. So the best of my knowledge, I don't think you can images having that either. Um, but some someone on the legal the uh, team the, the the group that spoke last hour would have a better handle on that one. Yeah, maybe I can say what the plan is for the Chameleon project. Uh, so we do uh, intend to have a data access committees. We haven't made a decision to make it fully open access yet. And indeed, we will also let it to the appreciations of the, 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 the data providers. Uh, and then uh, the idea is that some data may be in open access, some may be in, in restricted access, and there will be some, some committee, access committee to decide. Yeah. Uh, so it, it is 4 p.m. right now, that's, that's the end of our session, and, and I think there is a coffee break now, so if you want to take a pause and, and have, go have coffee, uh, I don't know if Emmanuel is still around and if you want to take over. Yeah, I'm here, yeah, I'm here, I'm here. Yeah, yeah, now we're going to have a coffee, and then uh, we move to the next session uh, about uh, obstacle and solution uh, with the moderation of Elisa Lauricchio. So. Well, thank you. you very much to all for, for this great panel and this great session. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.